Hi, I'm Kevin Harrington. I'm Samba Bachili. Nina Vaca, Chief Executive Officer of Pinnacle Group. An original shark from the hit TV show Shark Tank. The CEO of ADS Group. The largest Latina-owned workforce solutions in America. I first identified myself as an entrepreneur when I was 15 years old. My mother and father immigrated here with a suitcase and a dream. I had a front row seat to entrepreneurship. I am living proof of what is possible in this country. Today, the marketplace is, is very tough. The challenge for African market today is its access to capital. The number one reason why we can't scale as entrepreneurs is access to capital. What makes GLOW so different and so powerful is the access to experts, gurus, mentors, coaches, financiers, venture people, money. When I started my business, I immediately went to engage with different communities, different platforms. Glow makes that experience digital. A digital platform makes it so much faster and so much easier for you to meet like-minded people. The financial pl platform that Glow have that make Glow unique. Glow is about commerce, Glow is about community, and Glow is about having access to capital. Glow is an asset to every entrepreneur in this country and globally. It's, it's about helping you take your business, your idea, to the next step. Hi there, and welcome to Business Acceleration 2.0. It's the show where leaders go to grow. It's brought to you by the Business Finishing School and the Global Leaders Organization. Business Finishing School is an online program that was made for the entrepreneur who's looking to grow their business and make it more profitable, sustainable, and saleable, which is what we all want. Oops, sorry about that. Which is what we all want, right? Is to be able to sell our business. And even if you don't wanna sell your business, wouldn't you like to have someone approach you that would want to buy your business? So uh, Business Finishing School, they've got over 100 different videos, 48 modules. It's a fantastic program for anyone that's looking to grow their business. And the Global Leaders Organization is our other sponsor. It's a CEO membership organization made for the entrepreneur. That organization, has, it's founded on the four principles of community, commerce, capital, and content. And speaking of content, that's what we're here today, providing unbelievable content for you to help you grow your business as an entrepreneur, business owner. So today, um, right before we bring on our guest, Simon Manwaring, we're going to uh, cover just a little bit of housekeeping for us. So number one, if you're watching on social media, make sure to like and subscribe to us and share with every entrepreneur you know. This content is made for the entrepreneur. And it's free for every entrepreneur out there. We want to help them grow their business. Um, we are also going to be uh, doing our virtual event on March. The, um, sorry, not March. On May the 5th. Wait, March the 5th. Wait, we're going to have to edit all that out, Gage. So just note that. Um, okay, so I want to also make sure we mention that we're going to be doing our event on the virtual event on March the 5th, which is a Saturday from nine to four. It's an online program featuring Vince Pacenti, uh, featuring Rick Sapio, uh, Dre Red Redfern, and um, Kevin Harrington. So we're excited to have uh, the virtual event. You can tune in on March the 5th, Saturday. All right. So you're here today to hear from Simon Manwaring. And Simon is here with us today. He's the CEO and founder of We First, uh, which is a consulting agency that helps accelerate growth and impact for purpose-driven brands. So that's what we're going to be here all about today, purpose-driven brands, right? Uh, he's a New York Times bestselling author. He, he was the author of We First, and now his new book, Lead With We. So without further ado, let me bring on Simon Manwaring. Simon, thank you so much for being here with us today. Thanks, thanks uh, to all your listeners for tuning in. Yeah, we're very excited. Love the movement that you're creating, right? Um, so let's get right into it. Let's go ahead and, and talk about the, the lead with, with we movement. Tell us what it is and how we should be thinking about this and actually what we should be doing as entrepreneur and business owners. Well, you know, firstly, thank you for letting me share the framework. And here's the question we all face as entrepreneurs today. How do we grow our business in a way that's actually going to allow our businesses to survive? 
And what I mean by that is we're all intimately aware that we've got these huge issues out there and in the future, but also in our present from COVID through to the climate crisis, through to social inequities, plastics in the ocean, chemicals in the soil, carbon in the air. And the reason this is relevant to us is that brands can't survive in societies that fail. But here's the good news. Businesses that are intentionally purposeful and that they bring their purpose to life in ways that is meaningful, not just to their customers, but to their employees and their investors, will inspire them to build your business with you. Now, for that to happen, you've got to shift your focus from a me focused, me first, to really a we focus. And if you lead with we, that will allow you to solve for the issues that really affect your business in ways that will inspire everyone in your business community to build your business with you. So it's about reputation, it's about company culture, it's about sales and marketing, and it's about relevance to the future. So how is this different? I mean, we've, we've you know, Tom Shoes and there's, you know, other organizations that started with a cause. How is this different today? Um, yeah, it's a, great, it's a great question. You know, there's a timeline here. You know, back in the day, there was philanthropy, where at the end of the year, a company might write a check and they tick the do-good box. Then there was corporate social responsibility, where they'd look at how they were making stuff and maybe some policies in HR. And then more recently, you've seen the rise of sustainability and ESG, environmental, social and governance, and a lot of talk about purposeful brands. And so I'd characterize the shift this way. It used to be the exception to the rule. And, you know, Tom's was one of the companies that started the social enterprise movement. And I was actually interim CMO in there for a while and mm -hmm. at Tom's. And what we're seeing now is a wholesale shift where it's not about doing business just to make money. And if you've got money left over at the end, give something to do good. But it's about driving growth and building your bottom line by solving for these issues outright. And the only reason that we would even think this way is because the market forces reward companies for doing it. I mean, it's just naive to think that people are going to wake up every day and prioritize just doing good. They've got to keep their businesses going. So how do you do it? You, you, know, you leverage the market forces where people want to buy from, work for, or invest in companies that are doing good. And it's not just younger demographics, millennials and Gen Z, it's all the generations now. And why? Because every time we look at our phone, we see all these scary headlines that tell us how much trouble we're in. And so it's a big shift from a being a, a bolt-on or an add-on or an afterthought to being much more foundational and the center of gravity for business and then the market forces rewarding those companies that are doing it. But what I'm hearing you say, it sounds like that's something that government should be involved. Why should a business be at the forefront of that? Yeah, it's, it's not an either-or proposition. I mean, if government could do it on their own with all the challenges of partisanship and so on, they would have done it a long time ago. And, or if the nonprofits, foundations, NGOs could have done it, then they would have solved for these issues already and they're under resourced and so on. It has to be all sectors of society working together, but most notably business. Why? We have the, we have the resources, the reach, the bricks and mortar, the supply chains and the storytelling and the marketing savvy to shift consumer behavior to electric vehicles, to clean beauty products, to clean food and less you know, to more of a plant-based diet. So when you think about it, we are more equipped than government. We are more equipped than the nonprofit world to really not only lead with innovation, but do the communications piece and bring products to market that will retool consumer thinking and behavior. And one other comment on this, the reality is we made this mess together. You know, all these issues, plastic in the ocean, you know, unsustainable agriculture, pollution in the air, we all, everyone, by our little actions every day, created this problem. And not surprisingly, we're going to have to get out of it together. So business should be at the forefront, but it should do it in partnership with government and civil society as well. So what happens if you've got a business that's 10, 15, 20 years old, and that was not the core of your message? And you weren't really, you were thinking more bottom line profitability. What does a business do today to get, get you know, more in the direction of lead with we? Well, there's a few things you need to do, some of which are timeless and some of which are timely. The timeless things are you need to self-disrupt. You need to innovate. You need to keep pace with the changing marketplace. Look at the digital revolution. Look at blockchain now. Look at all the things that are coming, AI and VR and AR and so on. 
So you need to keep moving with the marketplace. But in terms of being more purposeful in business, if you're a legacy brand, 100 years old, 15 years old, you need to ask yourself some fundamental questions, which is, have you defined your purpose? On the strength of that purpose, have you done an audit of your company where you go, okay, what are the suppliers we're working with? What are we taking to market? How are we treating our people? And if you haven't, you need to define your purpose. And we do this work for startups all the way through to large corporations. You can ask yourself several key questions to define why you exist. And I'll give you a couple of examples. One is, what is your enemy? Which is, what's that thing that gets you out of the bed in the morning to solve for? You know, that really annoys you, that you know, motivated you to start your business. What are you the only of? There's only one CEO, founder, solopreneur like you. There's only one team like yours at this moment in time. And then thirdly, when you're at your best, what are you doing? When you're at your best, what are you doing? You know, when you're high-fiving each other and you've just crushed it, a presentation, a pitch, a launch, whatever it might be. When you start to answer those questions, you start to externalize what you take for granted on the inside, which is you all think you all know why you exist, but you haven't actually distilled it down. So if you're a legacy brand, you need to define your purpose and then really look at your company all the way upstream to your suppliers, all the way downstream to what products you take to market and your impact work and ask, is that an authentic expression of our purpose? Why? Because if you do, it will build your reputation. You'll attract the talent you need. Conscious consumers will buy your product and you'll solve for those issues on which your, you know, your business depends. Oh, that's such good advice. That's great. So you can actually take companies through that strategy, that process, so that they can yeah. learn and identify... Where they, should be, where they should be leading, I guess, with, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the book Lead with We lays this all out. It's 10 years of work with companies like Tom's and Timberland and Virgin and Sony and SAP. All of that insight is laid out for an entrepreneur. So you don't have to think that through. You don't have the bandwidth. You've got so many things to worry about. I'm a 10-year entrepreneur. You just, all you want to do is sit down for dinner with your family or kids or loved ones and have some time off on the weekend. Yeah, so the, right. blueprint, you know, the blueprint's in there for you. But also at the same time, you know, we need to recognize that it's not just you operating on your own that's going to create the result we need. You need to think more expansively. Lead with we is a decision-making filter where you can sit down, whether you're in payroll, R&D, sales, impact work, and say, okay, with this decision in mind, how do I lead? That is actually show up in a leadership capacity, not think about it, but actually show up with as many stakeholders as possible, even competitors, you know, for-profit, non-profit, government agencies to benefit the greatest we, which is the largest number of people and on the, the planet on which we depend. And the urgency around this can't be overstated. I'm not an alarmist person by nature, but as someone who's been in this space for 15 years, if you look at COP26, if you look at what was coming out of Davos, if you look at what we see in the headlines with sort of surprising and extreme weather around the world, amongst other things, I think we all know something's up. And unless we're part of the solution, we are going to all face the consequences of the problem. And for me, I don't want that in my life. And I sure as hell don't want it in my kid's life, you know? Okay, so I have a question. Let's go to the other side. What if you, because um, I've seen a lot of companies, that, you know, I've seen some, I shouldn't say a lot. I've seen some companies that are very unauthentic yeah. with saying that they're, they've got some sort of a cause or they're, you know, they're putting some sort of a, a purpose-driven mission before um, in front of their consumer. And you can tell that it's not authentic. What a, how do we overcome so that we, we do, that we are authentic if we're moving forward? The great news is exactly what you said. We start from a place of distrust today. If you look at Edelman's Trust Barometer report, which you know, came out for 2022 recently, People don't trust institutions, they don't trust marketers, they don't trust leaders, they trust their friends and their peers more so because there's that relationship capital there. So when we see a company put its hand up and say they're doing good, where, you know, it's like guilty until proven innocent. Right. And the really interesting thing today is it's not just the consumers will call them out. And we've seen that for decades on your Facebook account and news stories where brands get called out. And it's not just your employees. I mean, just think about Google and Apple and Amazon last year. All of their employees called out their companies for gender bias, pay scales, and so on. And even most recently, one of the biggest consulting firms in the world, McKinsey, 1,200 of their employees wrote an open letter to their own leadership saying, stop enabling the biggest polluters in the world. But it's also the investors. 
as entrepreneurs, we all depend on investors to kind of, you know, make our businesses possible to give us that capital to drive growth. And those investors not only want companies that are going to be part of the solution rather than part of the problem, but they want to invest in companies that will last in this marketplace. And you need to be purposeful to be relevant to this marketplace. So sometimes I think people think about being purposeful as, oh, it's a nice to do after mm -hmm. you've got done the real business of business. I am telling you, hand on my heart, with all of our consulting work with large and small companies, they are fully integrated now. And I'll give you one example to that end. You know, the CEO of BlackRock, Larry Fink, who does his annual letter every year, it's the largest money management firm in the world with $10.3 trillion in assets under management. As is very widely publicized, he has a, he's leading a dialogue around the re-engineering of business more broadly and the companies they recommend investing in on the strength of how well positioned they are to survive in the future, how purposeful, sustainable they are. And so with that in mind, your company, whether you're one person or 15 people, you know, you're a microcosm of that. So lead with your purpose because that will allow you to leverage these market forces and grow your business. I'm just curious. You have such passion when you're talking about this. Mm -hmm. How did you get to where you are? How did how did this even come about? Did you always believe in leading with we? No, I was I was the most self interested, self absorbed, self important ad guy you've ever seen. I ran around the world like a lot of Australians, thinking you're missing out on something else. And I worked in Australia, then the UK, and then you know for 20 years here in the US. Um, and I worked on Nike at Widen and Kennedy, their ad agency. I was worldwide creative director on Motorola and had a big job and launched the Razor phone with the with the rest of the folks in the team. And I was very much immersed in that world. But I came away from that unhappy. And it was really perplexing to me. And I don't know if any of the entrepreneurs watching have ever had this feeling. I had young kids, you know, I'd, I'd married for a short time. And I was working my butt off to try and pay the bills and do a good job and have a career. And yet inside, I wasn't happy. And only in hindsight do I realize what that was, which was I was looking for more meaning in my work. I didn't want to just sell stuff for selling sake. But the real turning point for me came Aaron, was when um, I walked into my kitchen one day and there was five messages on the answering machine. So that shows you it was about oh, just around 2000, a bit earlier. And there was a message from my mum, a message from my mum yelling down the phone to asking me to wake up because they were in Sydney with a time difference calling to LA. My sister on the third message yelling to try and wake me up because the kitchen and the bedroom are far apart. Another message from my mum. And then finally the last message. And my mum said, Simon, dad died. He was calling to say goodbye. Call us when you wake up. And I have to say that I hadn't seen my dad for five years. I've been running around living, doing a career thing that I thought was important, but that wasn't making me happy. And I was really emotionally destabilized. I got to be honest. I really didn't know what to do. I couldn't even think straight. I was like, I'm not happy at work. My dad's just passed. I don't even know what I'm doing anymore. I don't know how to be a dad. I don't even know what I am as a man or what am I doing? And for the first time in my life, I got out of my own way and I didn't rush to my head and write a list and try and think my way through it and try and make myself feel safe. I was just so at sea that I was just lost. And in that time, it was like two or three weeks later, I read a speech that Bill Gates gave at the World Economic Forum that year when it was 2008, the global economic meltdown. And he said, the private sector's just got to do more. They're creating all these problems. They've got to help out and so on. And so for me, when I heard that, I thought, yeah, that's true. I've been in all this business and working around the world, and we seem to get away with anything. We create all these problems. We don't clean them up. We have so much intelligence and expertise and resources. Why the hell aren't we doing more? And that led to the turning point in my journey. So no planning, but just life came along and slapped me on the side of the head and said, go that way. <laughs> you had a big awakening you yeah. know with i've got young kids not 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 young uh they're in their all in their you know just post-college right. and everything they do and everything they want to be involved with has to do with a business that has a purpose and that is doing yeah. something special right so it seems like with the younger generation they get it yeah is that is that right to say that well, all the data bears that out, but I think anecdotally, I mean, my daughters are 22 and 19 as well, and they think exactly the same way, and they're both young entrepreneurs, and they've got purpose to their business, and we're doing their strategy work together, and it's so much fun. But um, I think, just imagine if you're 20 or 20 years old or younger, you have grown up in a world where when you came of age where you could read or write or watch the news or hear what your parents were talking about, 
a rising dialogue about how perilous our future is. Climate, yeah. oceans, sea turtles, loss of species, God knows what. If you have heard nothing but this scary story messaging in those formative years all the way through, do you think you're going to double down on what your parents did? In fact, what the data shows is that they go into business to solve a problem. And if that solving solves a problem, then they'll make money. They do it the invert of what we used to do or the best intention of us, which was to make money and then do something good afterwards. The vast majority still today just want to make money and damn the consequences. But here's the reality. From my perspective, and we're lucky enough to work with P and venture-backed startups and these very large corporations and hear what the C-suite and the leadership are saying. These challenges we face are not sitting there out there in the future statically waiting for us to arrive. You know, climate crisis and 10 years time will be there and it'll all be over. They are compounding as we speak because they're all connected and they're hurtling back towards us in the present. And there is a hockey stick of expectation coming towards business where you it's not good enough just to be, do less bad or to not be part of the problem. The only companies that will survive and that will have their social license to operate and that will attract employees, have a reputation, drive sales, be relevant, will be those that are completely defensible in terms of the impact they're having and ideally are solving for a problem. That's not my opinion. If you look around at what's going on in our world, every headline, every day, and business is front and center, what do you think is going to happen? And this is the reality. So the more your companies, you know, people listening to Glow right now can be really clear about what their purpose is, how they bring that to life, how they attract the right employees, how they go to market, the better positioned you'll be for that hockey stick of expectation because the market forces will push you ahead. So then are you looking at, uh, as an as a if you go in and you start working with a company and you're consulting with them, do you look... I understand that you'd go in and see where they're, what, you know, what they're doing, where they're affecting human human life or the conditions around us. Um, but are there certain areas or topics or industries that you that you kind of lean into? Because you've mentioned climate quite a bit. Mm -hmm. you, um, are there certain areas that if we don't know, if just say our company really doesn't have um, some kind of a purpose driven mm -hmm. mission, uh, are there certain areas that we should maybe? try and, and connect with? Yeah, I mean, it's a good question because I think there are table stakes to operate in business today. And those table stakes have changed recently. And by table stakes, I mean, these are things that any company, no matter what you do, big, small, B2B, B2C, here in the US, overseas, must get right. And they are diversity and inclusion. You know, on the back of, you know, Black Lives Matter movement, the expectation, the scrutiny, the defensibility of your company turns on you being much more equitable, you know, and diverse and inclusive. Secondly, you have to pay a fair and living wage. You've seen here in the US how the, you know, the average hourly rate for restaurant staff has gone from 15 to 17 to $20. You've seen at Amazon $20 and above. You know, this is about, and, and if you look at, you know, um, uh, all the data out there in and around what issues are most important to Americans and just look at the just capital data. It's the number one issue, fair and living wage. It's not climate, it's fair and living wage. And then the third issue is sustainability or for big companies, environmental, social and governance. And that is, you know, environment is your impact on the natural world. Social is your impact on social systems, the ecosystems that make society possible. And governance is how you run your company. So those three areas, fair and living wage and, you know, sustainability and DNI are table stakes. Above and beyond that, you should lean into issues that are relevant to your brand. Let me give you an example. Mm -hmm. There was a pylon after Black Lives Matter where everyone started talking about diversity and inclusion, and they didn't. They weren't defensible. They didn't. They couldn't. You know, um, point to their own company as good examples and so on. But they just felt they had to, and they got called out a lot for that because they were all just jumping on the cause or issue bandwagon. But I'll give you an example of a of a sophisticated response. Maybe you know Harry's razors, the subscription shaving mm -hmm. razor thing. Yeah. During, during COVID, everyone was making PPE equipment, you know, ventilators, meals for medical practitioners and first responders. Harry said, wait a second, who's our audience? And their audience is young men. And there's a high incidence of suicide amongst young men. And they actually recognized that that was increasing during COVID. So what they did was instead of making PPE equipment, 
They partnered with Crisis Text Line and provided mental health support for young men during COVID who were losing their jobs and feeling very kind of distressed about their future. So there's an example of a brand facing the same expectation of COVID, have some response, but they responded in a way that's specific to their audience and appropriate to their needs so it aligned with their brand. Okay, so what if people are listening right now, running a business, and they say, so I mean, this all sounds great, yeah. but it's just continuing to add another line item on my expense, and I just can't handle you know, another expense item. Sure. We don't have the money to do it. Well, I would argue something slightly different, because there is a time and capital investment in this sort of work, but a couple of things. I've been in marketing 35 years. I was lucky enough to be one of the riders on Nike doing the Olympics and World Cup and all their famous athletes and running and launching big products like the Razor for Motorola. In 35 years of marketing, I've only ever seen three situations. Great product or service, bad story. Terrible <laughs> product and service, great story. That's even worse because people check out your product and they go, this thing sucks. <laughs> or great product and service, great story. Your brand is as important as your business because it's the story you tell to go to market. It makes people look at you, try your stuff, buy it, and talk about it to others. So outright, you have to invest time and capital in your brand. That's the first piece. Secondly, if the market has changed and increasingly companies are getting rewarded for being more intentional about their purpose and solving for issues, then you're actually running the risk of putting yourself out of business by not responding. And this is not do good stuff. I'm not talking about do good stuff. I'm talking about reputation as against your competitors who are talking about the good that they're doing. And I'm talking about the ability to attract talent because people want to work for companies doing good. I'm talking about the type of products you take to market and what consumers are willing to buy. Think about it, clean beauty, clean food, or, or, you know, electric vehicles, all the shifts that have happened. And I'm talking about relevance based on a clear eyed view of the future. Like is the world today the same as it was in the 1990s when it was greed is good? I don't think so. We're much more aware of the trouble we're in. So all of that is to say that if you don't have time and, or money to invest in your brand, good luck. If you're not willing to do that in a way that reflects today's market forces, that's problematic as well. And then you've just got to ask yourself, ignore everything I'm saying, ask yourself, if you look five or 10 years down the road, based on where we are now and your best estimate of what the world's like and the environment and society and so on and disparity of wealth and all these things, is it getting better or is it getting worse? And do you think the expectation on you is going to be more or less? in those areas. And if you respond appropriately, do you think you'll do better or worse? Or if you ignore it, do you think you might put yourself out of business? So a lot of this is just common sense to me. I mean, all the data is there, all the case studies are there, the needs, the urgency to solve for these things are there. It just comes down to whether you can, as an entrepreneur and as a fellow entrepreneur, I so respect this, carve out the time to recognize you need to have an effective brand to recognize that the more purposeful the brand is, it'll help your reputation, your culture, your employees, your product innovation, your marketing, and then to put the capital and time against that. I think that would be a much smarter way to set yourself up for success. Oh, that's a great way for us to really to bring this to a closure. I want to know what's next, though, for Simon. What, what are you up to now? Well, uh, you know, there's a couple of things. Firstly, you know, I just got the book out in November and thankfully it was very well received and bestseller lists and all those sorts of things. So first thing is first, I would love if, if you're, if what I've shared with you intrigued you to get the book and take, get the benefits of 10 years of work with these really great brands and, and apply that to your business. It'll continue to pay dividends for the next five, 10 years for sure. But buy a second copy and give it to someone, you know, a young entrepreneur like you or a, a corporate type who you think would be responsive to this, because just by giving them that thinking, you can totally change the way that they do their business and you can have massive impact. And that's incredibly fulfilling. I'm just um, curious, have you created movements with lead with me? I mean, lead, lead with we in different cities. Yeah. We, you know, we, we built brand movements. So mm -hmm. we repositioned Timberland 
and did all their strategy work and worked with them on platforms that led to Earth Keepers and Nature Needs Heroes. And these are global movements, you know, 50 million trees being planted and things like that. You know, we repositioned Tom's. And as I said, I was interim CMO in there. And we did a lot of initiative work at the time. They were doing, you know, shoes and sunglasses and school bags right. and other things. Every brand we work with, we help them become a movement. And that is just a lofty way of saying, how do we inspire all stakeholders from your suppliers to your employees to your customers to really kind of want to rally around the role you're playing in the world and build your business with you? So we do it across the board with, with everyone we work for. So the second thing is in terms of what I'm up to, if people have more questions or they want to know about what we do, they can always just connect directly with me at simon at wefirstbranding.com. And then the other thing is um, I will be doing, you know, releasing some courses this year. We're in the process of kind of providing instruction and, and guidance because I think my big mission in life now is to just support, like Glow, the next generation of entrepreneurs and allow you to get this incredible gift of doing work that is not only financially rewarding, but is personally fulfilling as well. I think that's what true success looks like. Well, your passion is contagious. I mean, I'm ready to go out and I actually feel like we do have our cause and we, we, we're, we're all about the entrepreneur. Entrepreneurs need so much help right now. Um, they need help with capital. They need help with con uh, yeah. education, with just a, c a community. So yeah. we have to provide that. Um, so I, I feel like we're, we're very much leaning into what our purpose is. Simon, you are so wonderful. This has been so great. Um, thank you. Thank you. Yes. And just as Simon said, we'll have up the information for the book and a link straight to Amazon so that you can go and purchase the book. But do as Simon did, said, go and purchase it, but purchase two books and give one to a new entrepreneur or someone else that you know in the industry. So Simon, thank you so much. Really, You are, really you are, so, you are so welcome. And I just want to leave one last thought. Yeah. If you're disheartened right now, if you feel like the future is kind of dark and gloomy, don't be. The entrepreneurship is the key. You know, every one of these challenges we face is a marketplace opportunity in disguise. Look at the revolution in the auto industry, the clean beauty industry, the clean food industry. Go out there and get at it. The more you solve for this, the more the market will reward you. And when we do this together, there is nothing we can't achieve. So do be optimistic. Do look into, you know, get the support from each other and go like hell because this is the time for entrepreneurs. It really is. I agree 100%. So thank you. That was great. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. So if, to learn more about Simon, be sure and go to his website. We've got it right here up in the uh, underlays of Simon. Simon, give him the website one more time. Yep. If you go to leadwithwe.com, you'll see about the book. And if you're interested in consulting and so on, go to wefirstbranding.com. Wonderful. Okay. All right. Well, it's uh, it's come to an end, our time together with Simon. Simon, thank you very much. And uh for all those that are still tuning in, want to make sure that you check out the virtual event that we're doing on Saturday, March 5th, and uh, be sure to check out Glow with Glow.com and Business Finishing School, online program for the entrepreneur. All right. Thank you very much. And until next week, stay safe and God bless.